Hi, Mam Chat. Hi, I, I'm just testing my microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Director Anna. Okay, naman ang sounds. Yes, po. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, Anna. Hi, chat. Hi, Anna. <coughs> ma'am Sel. Hello.
Hello, good afternoon everyone. I'm Sheila Sior. I'm your moderator. So we'll start at uh, 2 o'clock. Some of you may have noticed that our that your microphones are um, are muted. Um, please uh, don't be worried because we do this to prevent any background noise. Nevertheless, rest assured that you can still participate in the discussion. If you have any question or if you have um, any comments, just use the, the chat box. Just type your your uh, question or your comment there. Okay, see you at two o'clock. Good afternoon, everyone. It's Thursday once again, and welcome to the PIDS webinar series where we tackle development issues based on data and evidence. I'm Sheila Siyar, and I will be moderating this event. For this afternoon, we will talk about a PIDS study which provided options in how to finance the additional revenues that our local government units are supposed to receive with the implementation of the Supreme Court decision on the new computation of the internal revenue allotment. I now call on our president, Dr. Celia Reyes to officially open our event and share her insights about this topic. Ramsel? Thank you, Sheila. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before we start with the presentation, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of the following officials. Uh, from the national government, uh, we have the ILG Undersecretary Maribel Sassendoncillo. Um, we have the ILG, the LGD, um, Director Anna Bonagua and um, also Assistant Director Alfonso Marali. Um, from DOF, BLGF, Director Pamela Quizon and Deputy Executive Director Attorney Flossi Fanlo Tanyag. Um, and from CPBRD, we have Deputy Executive Director Attorney Ronchen Bronce and um, Director Novel Banasal and Budget Policy Research Service Director Pamela Manalo. 
and Director Dina um, Pasagi and um, Director Dominador Gamboa. And from CHED, uh, I would like to welcome Commissioner Dr. Alex Brillantes and from NED, our Mother Agency, Governance Staff Director Thelma Manuel and our NEDA Regional Director Milagros Rimando, Regional Director Nesta Rillon, Regional Director Susan Sumbeling, Regional Director Agnes Espinas Tolentino, Regional Director Roan Bacal, Regional Director Maileen Rosales, Regional Director Lourdes Lim, um, Regional Director Teresita Socorro Ramos, Regional Director Attorney Bonifacio Uy, and uh, from DBM, we have Director John Aris Makaspak and Regional Director Renato De Vera. And from PAPCOM, we have Director Reynaldo Wong. And from NLRC, we have Director Elvira Cruz. We're also joined um, by um, local chief executives, in particular, Mayor Carlo Medina of Vican Ilocosur and Vice Mayor Loy Fegalan of Panton Romblon and Vice Mayor Aidel Belamide of Silang Cavite. Um, from the academe, we have Ateneo School of Government Dean Dr. Ronald Mendoza, Jesse M. Robredo Institute of Governance Director Dr. Ador Torneo, UPNC PAG Dean Professor Dan Sagil, CIFAL Philippines Director Edna Estefania, Cavite State University College of Nursing Dean Dr. Evelyn Del Mundo, USAP College of Development Management Dean, um, Dr. Rec Egia, and um, our very own uh, from the PIDS Board of Trustees, Attorney Rafael Lopilia. And we also have with us today um, CSO representatives uh, led by ULAP Executive Director Bernardino Sayo, League of Cities of the League of Cities of the Philippines Deputy Executive Director Maria Veronica Hitosis and Local Government Development Foundation National Coordinator, Dr. Antonio Avila Jr., Code NGO Deputy Executive Director, Dini Ocampo, Villar Foundation Director, Reggie Tamana, Social Watch Co-Convener, Ms. Jessica Cantos, and Una Hakbang Foundation, um, President Oli Luca. So welcome to, to this forum. We also want to welcome our colleagues from the government and representatives from the academe, civil society, private sector, and our Facebook viewers to this afternoon's webinar. For those who are attending for the first time, we conduct this weekly webinar as part of our research dissemination wherein completed studies of PIDS are presented to the public. Today, we'll be hearing from Dr. Rosario Manasan, former PIDS Senior Research Fellow, about her study on fiscal sustainability equity and allocative efficiency in the light of the 2019 Supreme Court ruling on the LGU share in national taxes, otherwise known as the Mandanas ruling, named after its lead petitioner, Governor Hermilando Mandanas of Batangas, who's here with us today as one of the discussants. Just to give you a brief background, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the petition of then Congressman Mandanas who questioned the basis of determining the source and appropriation of the Internal Revenue Allotment or ERA for local government units. Um, the Supreme Court decided in finality that the share of local governments in the computation of the ERA should not only be limited to the national internal revenue taxes, but it should also include customs duties and other taxes collected by the national government. As a result of the court decision, the ERA share of local governments is expected to increase starting in 2022. Given this latest development in ERA distribution, the PIDS study provides us some options which government may consider in sourcing out funds for the augmentation of LGU ERA shares in 2022 and beyond. It's important to keep everything aligned to the country's medium-term fiscal program to ensure fiscal sustainability both in the national and local levels. It also looked into the impact of financing the increase of the era, specifically on the vertical fiscal balance across different levels of government and horizontal fiscal balance across individual LGUs within each level of local government. Furthermore, the study shows us how government can minimize fiscal disparities among LGUs, especially in terms of local taxation. For today's webinar, we have also invited Governor Mandanas himself 
and Bureau of Local Government uh, Development Director Annalisa Bonagua of the Department of the Interior and Local Government to give their comments and insights on the study's findings and recommendations and its implication on fiscal decentralization. We'll also be hearing from Director Bonagua the DILG's preparations and plans of action to ensure the smooth implementation of the Mandanas rule. So I'd like to encourage all of you to stay until the end and actively participate in the open forum later. Once again, let me thank you for participating in today's forum. We hope to see you in our future public webinars. Thank you also to our PIDS webinar team composed of Director Sheila Siar, Gwen Taliping, and Gwen De La Cruz for organizing this forum. I now give back the floor to Sheila, our moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mamsel. Well, before we proceed with our presentation, may I have your attention regarding our house rules. For all attendees, your microphone is muted upon entry, and this is to prevent any background noise, but this doesn't mean that you cannot uh, participate in a discussion. To join the open forum, just use the chat box, which is located at the lower part of your screen. Just type your name and your um, question, and uh, I will um, um, read your question during the open forum Please make sure that your questions are concise so we can entertain um, more questions during the open forum. And since um, and for all our uh, viewers who are uh, watching us on Facebook, you are also very much welcome to participate in our open forum. Just type your question in the comment section. OK, so let us now proceed with the presentation. Our resource person is, is an expert in local governance fiscal policy and public expenditure analysis. She is a former senior research fellow at the PIDS, and she has written extensively on uh, fiscal decentralization in the Philippines, having worked in this area since 1991. She has also published numerous articles on taxation, public expenditure management, public expenditure analysis, and social sector financing issues. Her most recent papers are on two of the most hotly debated topics in recent years. Uh, designing the fiscal features of a federal system of government, autonomy, accountability, and equity considerations, and an assessment of the 2017 tax reform for acceleration and inclusion. These papers, by the way, are downloaded from the PIDS website. She earned her bachelor's degree in statistics from the University of the Philippines, that's the Statistical Center, now UP School of Statistics, and she received her PhD in economics from the University of the Philippines and did postdoctoral studies at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Friends, Dr. Rosario Manasan. Ma'am Chat? Ma'am Chat, your microphone, please. Hello? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Let me proceed to the paper. This is an overview of the presentation, and I'll go straight to the objective of the paper. First, let me start with the background. In January 2012, former Governor Mandanas filed a petition at the Supreme Court seeking to compel the national government to um, include internal revenue taxes collected by the Bureau of Customs that excise and documentary taxes in the computation of the ag aggregate share of LGUs in national internal revenue taxes as provided in the local government code. The, uh, Mandanas also questioned the deduction of certain items from the IRA share. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. In August 2013, the late uh, Representative Garcia filed a petition at the SC also seeking to compel the national government to compute IRA on the basis of all taxes, not only internal revenue taxes. Both petitioners plead for the prospective application of the SC ruling should the uh, SC agree with them that the present manner of computing the IRA does not give LGUs a just share in national taxes. In July 2018, and which is affirmed in an April 2019 decision, 
the SC rule that aggregate IRA should be computed as 40% of all taxes, not just internal revenue taxes, and that the deductions from the IRA being questioned by Mandanas are valid. The application is not, I'm sorry, this is a typo, the application of increasing the IRA is not prospective, or rather is prospective, this is correct. The application of the ruling is prospective on the basis of the post of operative doctrine. Thus, the increase in the IRA arising from this ruling will start in 2022. In December 2019, the DBCC estimates the 20, April 2019 SE ruling on the Mandanas Garcia petitions will result in an increase in the aggregate era in 2022 from 847.4, if the old manner of computing the era were followed, to 1.1 uh, trillion or an increment of 225 billion or point point uh, or roughly 1% of GDP. Now the objectives of the study, the study aims to find, answer the following question. First, what are the options available to government that will allow it to allocate 1.1 uh, trillion for the era in FY2022 while keeping within the bounds of its medium-term fiscal program? That is while ensuring fiscal sustainability. The second question it tries to answer is what is the impact, if any, of the manner by which the increase in the era resulting from the SC ruling uh, on what is the impact of the increase in the era on vertical and horizontal fiscal balance across the different levels of LGUs and across LGUs within each level. Third, how does one minimize the fiscal disparities across LGUs so as to provide all LGUs the ability to provide comparable level of public services at comparable rates of taxation? And for what policy instruments are available to government to ensure that national objectives are met, given that an increasing proportion of total general government spending will be made by LGUs with significant funding coming from the ERA, which is a block grant. In terms of fiscal sustainability, there are really three options. The first one is to increase tax rates or impose new taxes so as to generate additional revenue equal to roughly 1% of GDP in 2022, plus an additional 0.35 of GDP in 2025, and an additional 0.14% of GDP in 2028, etc., over and above the incremental revenues from tax reform, which were intended to fund build, build, build. This will not the EC may not even be feasible, given that the increase in tax effort from the train one was just equal to 0.5% of GDP yearly in 2018 and 2019. In fact, now with the COVID uh, uh, impacting negatively on the economy, in tax revenues are down. This table simply gives you the trend in the tax effort, both from the BIR and the BOC. The other option to ensure fiscal, to finance the increase in the IRA is to increase the fiscal deficit by 0.9% of GDP yearly. Increasing fiscal deficit likely to be fiscally sustainable in the short term, given that the country's NG debt to GDP ratio is lower than the international benchmark, but implementing a more expansionary fiscal stance long term may be risky from a fiscal sustainability in, uh, perspective. Note that increase, the increase in the era is really not a one-off. It will continue prospectively from 2022 onwards. The third op option is to unfund some programs, activities, and projects that are now funded under the General Appropriations Act to create fiscal space for 
the increase in the era. This means that the national government will have 225.3 billion pesos less budgetary resources with which to fund public services that it has been providing the public prior to the CMSC decision. The question then is, how can the national government ensure no corresponding reduction in the delivery of public services, even as its spending on its own account is reduced? And here we argue that this can be done by selecting programs that will be unfunded such that we choose programs that are currently being funded under the budgets of some national government agency from the GAA, but which represent functions that are assigned to LGUs under the 1991 local government code. Uh, the DBM has called such a move redevolution. Take note that um, for the longest time, even if some services have already been devolved, the national government, at least some certain national government agencies, continue to include in their budgets uh, programs, activities, and projects for devolved functions. So now, given that the it Given that option three appears to be the more realistic option for fiscal sustainability, we then ask ourselves, how do we choose programs, activities, and projects that are now funded under the budgets of some NGAs in the GAA that may be unfunded? First, we argue that you identify the POPs in the NGA budgets that are included in the list of functions that are assigned to LGUs under the Section 17 of the LGC. In other words, we're, we want to, we will look at the GAA, try to identify programs, activities, and projects that are actually devolved function as per the local government code. Uh, he, this table is simply just a summary of the functions that are assigned to local governments under the local government codes, covering agricultural extension, natural resource management, environmental services, health services, local infrastructure services, social welfare, housing, DRR, solid waste management, and others. Take note that the functions in the table I've shown below are, are above are for the most part high level functions, meaning they're expressed in very broad terms. Health, uh, section 17 of the local government code, for instance, appear to say that all of her health services should be the responsibility of local government units. However, if you look at health, one may argue that not all health services are appropriately assigned to LGUs when, when health is considered in its entirety based on principles of expenditure assignment. So there is a need to unbundle or deconstruct these broadly defined functions. So the second step in identifying the PAPs that will be unfunded from the GAA is to narrow down the initial list of PAPs that we identify as per uh, in the step above, taking into account the following principles of expenditure assignment. First, that function and competencies whose benefits are local in scope should be assigned to local governments. Provision of public goods and services that either involve economies of scale are best assigned to higher level governments. Functions that involve significant externalities, that means, in other words, functions whose benefits spill over outside of local jurisdiction should be assigned to higher level of governments. And finally, that functions related to the redistributive role of government 
are best assigned to the central government. Following those principles, in this table we have identified, we have tried to unbundle the different PAPs in the budgets of various departments uh, and identify the more specific PAPs, not all, that are uh, truly appropriate to be devolved to LGUs. For instance, from DA, irrigation network services, the small irrigation services, also agricultural machinery, DA farm to market roads, from the DOH budget, human resources for LGUs. For instance, doctors to the barrios, uh, nurses, the RN Hills, the nurses, the hiring of nurses to be deployed to local governments, social health protection assistance or as health assistance to indigent patient, etc. Supplementary feeding from the DSWD, services for residential and service uh, center-based clients from the DSWD, uh, from the DPWH, construction rehabilitation of various in infrastructure projects, including local infrastructure projects. Of course, the, low, the LGSF, the Local Government Support Fund, the M MDA Solid Waste Management Program, uh, Barangay Officials Debt Benefits, et cetera, et cetera. So far, we have identified a total of 247 billion pesos from the 2020 GAA that may be unfunded. The biggest contribu contributor to this amount is uh, the DPWH, uh, which accounts, which has 164 billion pesos included in its budget for various local infrastructure. Next is the LGSF, the Local Government Support Fund, and the DOH. The question that if, if you look at these numbers here in this uh, slide, you will note that the amount of appropriated for the PAPs we have identified is bigger than the projected increase in the era by roughly 22 billion pesos. The question then that begs to be asked is should the national government reallocate to other national government functions, these 22 billion pesos that is in, the, in excess of the amount required to fund the increase in the IRA. The short answer is no, because additional financing is needed to address vertical and horizontal fiscal imbalance issues. And that's going ahead of my story here. So now let me go into issues related to vertical and horizontal fiscal imbalance. Vertical fiscal imbalance across different levels of LGUs is evident if one uh, scrutinizes the data. In particular, if one assumes that the national government is not only omniscient, meaning all-knowing, but also benevolent in the sense that its budget allocation decisions are aimed at maximizing the welfare of its citizens, at least in the aggregate, then the implication is that it is important to ensure that LGUs continue to provide the services associated with identified EAPs in the previous table that I have shown. For this to happen, the following conditions will have to be met. First, the increase in the IR IRA of all LGUs in the aggregate should be enough for them to deliver the same level of services that were made available to local constituents prior to the effectivity of the SC era ruling. And second, the second condition is that LGUs should prioritize the services associated with the unfunded PATs. Given this background, if we are to verify the first condition, uh, what we did is to assign, at least notionally, the 2020 
GAA appropriations for the un for the proposed unfunded PAPs to provinces, cities, and municipalities in a manner that is consistent with Section 17 of the Local Government Code. For instance, if the code says uh, farm to market roads from the DA budget, who will be, or rather, let me put it this way. For instance, if we look at the budget for farm to market roads in the Department of Agriculture budgets, that amount we assigned notionally to municipalities because municipalities are for the most part in charge of barangay to market road of farm to market roads. One can also argue that perhaps we can um, assign that to barangays, but at this point in time, that's kind of risky knowing that uh, barangays do not really have the capability to do much infrastructure investment. So after doing that, we then compare the aggregate amounts assigned to each level of LGU with the increase in the era of each level to provide evidence of whether there is vertical fiscal balance across the different levels of LGU. The results are found in this table. So what we see here is that the notional share of provinces, cities, and municipalities and barangays in red devolved spending of NG amounting to 225 billion uh, the share of provinces is close to 38%, while that of cities is 20% and municipalities 22.6%. Now, con con compare these shares with what the LGUs will receive uh, uh, across different levels of LG as per the era distribution formula. So as per the era distribution formula in the 1991 code, provinces will receive 23%, which is less than what they should be delivering as uh, if, uh, if the spending were to be the same uh, from the PAPs. So in short, what we found out to summarize is that there is a vertical imbalance problem across different levels of LGU as indicated by the net incremental era transfer being negative for provinces and cities, more severe for the former compared to the latter and net era transfer being positive for municipalities and barangays, larger for barangays compared to the municipalities. Take note that this result, the vertical in fiscal imbalance result, is also found in earlier years, in particular, uh, uh, an earlier, much, much earlier study in 2005 found out that the, the net resource transfer uh, is negative for provinces and municipalities and positive for cities from 1995 to 1999. Prospectively, there is a need for a more comprehensive evaluation of the vertical fiscal imbalance, taking into account not just the incremental uh, functions that, has, that will be redevolved given the funding source for the increase in the IRA, but the totality of all functions assigned to LGUs. At the same time, the study looks at evidence of horizontal fiscal imbalance across individual LGUs. And to do this, what the study did is to uh, check whether each LGU, each 
province, its city, its municipality will have an incremental era that will allow each one of them to provide comparable uh, level of services related to the PAPs that are proposed to be redevolved to them. And what is done here is to allocate notionally the increase in the, the PAP funding to individual LGUs within each level on the basis of some objective measure of need. We did not try to replicate, it should be emphasized, that the study did not try to replicate how NGAs allocate their spending on PAPs to the regional and sub-regional level. We do know, um, for instance, that it's very difficult to, in this case, assume that the allocation of resources to individual LGUs or even regions is in fact um, uh, appropriate or efficient given the very political nature of uh, the funding for most of these PAPs, in particular uh, the funding for various local infrastructure embedded in the DPWH budget, for instance, which we know is really for all intents and purposes, pork barrel that is determined uh, during budget preparation, just to work around the PDAF ruling of the Supreme Court in a much earlier decision. So having doing this, after doing this exercise, here, this table shows the basis for distributing the amounts that will be unfunded for the different functions from the different of the different departments to individual provinces, cities, municipalities, and barangays on the basis of what we call objective. Um, Ob objective evidence of needs at the LGU level. The final result of this subset of the exercise for this study is to show, or rather shows, that 66 out of 81 percent, uh, 66 of 80, out of 81 provinces, or 82 percent of provinces, have negative net resource transfer 43 out of 145 cities will or 30 percent of them will have net resource transfers and 10 percent or close to 11 percent municipalities will have net resource negative net resource transfers again this echoes findings in earlier studies but for the entirety of the era just to show you some flavor, uh, granular uh, flavor to these findings. These are the top 10 provinces as well as the bottom 10 provinces in terms of net per capita resource transfer. Batanes, as usual, gets uh, about 4,600 pesos per capita in terms of net resource transfer, meaning increase in era, less increase in the funding they need. Um, the smaller provinces in particular have positive net resource transfer, Batanes, Dinagat, Biliran. The, the major losers here we see Oriental Mindoro, Ilocos Norte, Apayao, quite a bit of uh, car provinces here. These are the winners and losers among municipalities and the winners and losers among cities. Now, if the horizontal fiscal imbalance is to be addressed, we need equalization grants, i.e. grants that will attempt to 
over and above the ERA grants that will try to address the disparity in the fiscal capacity or the increase in the ERA relative to their needs. To conclude, the, we go back to the first question or one of the first questions we ask, should the national government uh, reallocate to other national government functions the 22 billion that is in excess of the amount required to fund the increase in the era. The answer is no, we use this amount to implement first an equalization grant, and the second is an engine NG counterpart in conditional matching grant or cost sharing arrangement that will incentivize LGUs to spend in a manner that is consistent with national priorities or objectives. In addition to NG cost sharing mechanism, other mechanisms that will encourage LGUs to prioritize spending on national objectives and or merit goods include creating local demand for devolved services, mean first of which would relate to raising public awareness on functional assignment of NG versus LGUs. For the longest time, when something goes wrong in terms of service delivery at the LGU level, the public local constituents would very seldom blame local governments. Instead, they blame the national government. There's traffic in Manila, we blame, uh, we don't really blame the local governments in Manila. Rather, we say, President Digong, uh, please address the traffic problem in Metro Manila. Garbage is not collected in our barangays. Most of the time, we complain, but not to the LGU, not to the municipality or the city. At the same time, so that's raising public awareness, we should educate the citizens to demand the right the public services that are devolved services from their local governments. And the other uh, mechanism is improving citizen CSO participation in local planning and budgeting. I think that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ma'am Chat. Um, Again, if you have questions, just uh, use the chat box um, on um, just uh, uh, click the, the chat icon and the type your question and send it to everyone. OK, and we will uh, read your question during the open forum. OK, so let us hear what our discussants have to say about the, the study, the recommendations of Dr. Manasan. And our first discussant is the director of the Bureau of uh, Local Government Development of the Department of Interior and Local Government. She supervises several programs to enhance capacities of local government, local governments for um, greater autonomy to pursue local economic development and to encourage good performance through a performance-based incentive program such as the ease of doing business and improving competitiveness of LGUs. Performance Challenge Fund, rationalizing local planning and mainstreaming uh, disaster risk or reduction and, um, and CCA in local development planning, gender responsive local governance, SDG localization and establishment of the community based monitoring system, among others. She also leads the, the implementation of different projects supported by uh, the UNTP, ADB, and us, such as uh, the local governance and budget reform program, poverty environment initiatives, and review of the local government code. Our uh, discussant holds a bachelor's degree in statistics and a master's degree. In, uh, in public administration major in local and regional government from the University of the Philippines. Friends, uh, here now is Director Annalisa Bonagua of uh, the DALG Bureau of Local De Government Development. Director Anna. Um, thank you, Sheila. Uh, thank you, Doc Manasan, for uh, the comprehensive report of the study. Um, Dr. Manasan has been has done several studies for the ILG, I think for uh, I think for many of the NGAs and results of which were incorporated in some of the policies and focuses of the ILGs and the NGAs. 
Um, I was requested to provide comments and insight on the study findings and recommendations, the implication on the fiscal decentralization and uh, uh, department's preparation and action plan for the implementation of the Supreme Court ruling in FY uh, 2022. Um, I believe uh, DOF and DBM would be in the best position to provide insights on the study. Nonetheless, um, being an advocate of uh, the interest of local government teammates and uh, a part of the oversight agency for local government, I'll be giving some of my insights. Most might not be officially the stand and policy yet of the DILG since there's none yet issued. So, uh, and uh, I think Yusik Mabel is here to confirm our uh, initial uh, findings or recommendation. Okay, to start uh, with, as uh, the national government court ruling on the Mandanas and the Garcia petitions, uh, increasing the local government share in the national taxes in FY 2022, the national government actually welcomes all, all studies, assessments, evidences, uh, that will give us guidance in drafting the policy systems and standards to operationalize the Supreme Court. So on the study, um, on the proposed options to finance the era increase, uh, well, Dr. Manasa and Dr. Chat laid down uh, three options for national government to implement the Supreme Court ruling on uh, increasing the LG share by computing uh, the 40% Alam ko, pa ba ang tawag dito? Kasi hindi na siya internal revenue. So, 40% uh, local government shares based on the national taxes. So, the three options is, are those are, well, start with uh, the first one, increase national government revenue over and above its program level of, uh, program level by introducing new revenue measures, uh, which she presented will not be easy or may not even be feasible. The second one is to increase the national government's fiscal deficit uh, target yearly, which is physically feasible in the short term, but will be too risky in the long term. And the last one, the third one, is to cut back on national government spending to create a fiscal space for the additional uh, requirement of 225.3 uh, billion share in the national taxes for by unfunding the PPAs uh, at the national level. So which PPAs do we, do we unfund? So these should be PPAs uh, by some national government agencies implementing functions that are already assigned to local government units per local government code, but the national government agencies uh, continue to implement. Seems at this time, uh, national government option three, and I believe DPM has started with the inventory as probably as presented by uh, Dr. Chat. Uh, and as from the proposed cut uh, at, uh, from the national budget to cover the budgetary requirement uh, to increase the era of by 2022. Uh, there is even a projected increase as presented an excess or a projected excess of 22.3 billion. Uh, this means uh, that national government has been allocating more resources in support of local government service delivery functions. For this year, uh, and even in the previous years, than what is than the expected increase by local government units in by 2022. So, ibig lang that we are already supporting local government service delivery via this transfer, though being uh, implemented or uh, by the national government agencies. Um, on the statement of Doc Manasan uh, regarding the cutback on the national government budget uh, should not result on the diminution of, diminution of public service delivery. Therefore, these PPAs uh, should be sustained by local government units is something that we at the national level is hopeful. hopeful uh, uh, we're hopeful we are not seeing any assurance of uh, that happening. On the resulting horizontal and vertical imbalance, we fully agree uh, that the incremental resource transfer uh, to local government needs by 2022 
uh, though will definitely improve or provide more resources to LGUs for service delivery, will not result in comparable service uh, level of services across local government units. Yeah, it will increase the pie, yes, uh, but it will not correct the existing inequity and imbalance across levels of local government units and even uh, within levels of local government units. Uh, on vertical uh, in imbalance, from the inventory of the FY 2020 uh, PPAs or PAPs, uh, PAPs or PPAs, uh, being proposed to be cut in the national budget and redevolved to local government units by 2022, we can see that the allocated amounts for the PPAs uh, per LGU level, which um, Doc Chat called, called this notional share, uh, vary with the percentage share of local government units based on the era distribution formula, which is 23% for provinces, 34% for municipalities, 23% for cities, and 20% for barangays. So we can see that, uh, for example, in the, in the table shown, there is more resources allocated for the provinces for the current PPAs being implemented by national government in the 2020 budget. So this is because uh, the allocation of PPAs uh, of the national agencies are based on the local government needs, at least uh, at the perspective of the national government. These are the, uh, the projects uh, that we think we need by a certain level of local government needs. For example, uh, provinces uh, have the larger allocation in the FY 2020 GAA, namely because, at least in the case of the ILG, uh, to balance the limited resource allocation for provinces, given the, the, uh, the limited revenue raising powers and the uh, uh, big uh, and also the direction of the national government and capacity of provinces to perform more oversight function as provided under the local government code and for provinces to have more strategic role in service delivery. As we can see from the table presented that most of the projects are those uh, with have strategic um, uh, control or strategic direction such, such as infra, road network, health system management. So I think that's, that's the, uh, the, the reason for such. Uh, we fully support Dr. Chat's uh, recommendation on the expenditure assignment. I think this would be this would need a comprehensive study and a review of the expenditure responsibilities of local government units to be able to delineate which functions are best performed at which level based on their competencies and capacities. And uh, also following the principles of expenditure assignments, such as economies of scales, externalities, and spillover of benefits, and the redis redistributive role of government, government, not just national unity. Um, there should be a clear delineation of the roles across levels of local government units, what responsibilities assigned at each level, and what are those shared across levels. Um, right now, actually, this probably might be the opportun an opportunity to do this, um, at least for PPAs identified to be redevolved. But the national government is preparing for the uh, redevolution transition plans. Um, this will give the national agency the opportunity to review and study the expenditure assignments that national government will be uh, uh, should include in their transition plan what should be transferred at what particular level of local government units they think should be best performed and which has the best capacity and the competency to actually implement such. And also, uh, that there should also be corresponding capacity building in order for them to effectively carry that out. Um, on the horizontal imbalance across individual levels of local government units, um, horizontal imbalance across each level of local governments is likewise expected since um, the shares of each local government units are contingent on the parameters such as population, land area, equal sharing. This does not take into account LGU disparities uh, relative to varying capacities, resource endowment, and development potential. Other LGUs may be able to mobilize resources, generate local revenues, 
uh, more than the other or the rest of the uh, LGUs. Uh, well, as already mentioned in the amounts allocated to LGUs in the GAA uh, or in the 2020 GAA, uh, this is based on the need of individual LGUs. Like, for example, the allocation on the, the for example, uh, the road projects are based on kilometer road requirements. Salin Tubig is based on, Salin Tubig of DILG is based on the number of households which have uh, difficult in accessing potable water. Therefore, NG should continue to uh, in some gaps, uh, provinci provinces which less, which has less resources, has less revenue re uh, raising capacity, but should play a critical role in directing, harmonizing, integrating developments uh, uh, should be assisted. We fully support the need for equalization grants uh, to address that horizontal imbalance problem. Equity cannot be addressed by one transfer alone, much more uh, through a block grant such as the ERA. So there's a need for uh, intergovernmental transfer that is designed for the purpose of supporting the achievement of the national objectives of when spending authority has been decentralized, such as, for example, setting the national minimum standards for public services and additional output-based and uh, non-matching grants or equalization grants aimed at addressing the fiscal gap as, well as the equity consideration acro across local government units. Um, to answer the question kanina, in the long basis na tinanong ni Doc Chat, I think uh, this is where the national government should use that 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 22.3 billion excess of the amount of funds. Uh, In this era, I should continue to the governments. Probably this can be uh, the fund source for the equalization grants. Since um, for inventory, these are really the funds used by national government uh, to support local government services. Therefore, this should be used primarily for to support, again, uh, local government. So this could probably be the source for the equalization grant. Uh, on the impact of fiscal decentralization, um, well, with the projected increase in LG resources, national government are expected to transition to a more catalytic role, uh, such as technical assistance, performance oversight. And local government units are thus uh, expected to assume the implementation of the gold function as prescribed under the local government code and other succeeding uh, pertinent laws. With uh, the local government unit units assuming more uh, of the devolved functions and in consideration of the varying capacities of LGUs, LGU absorptive capacity poses a challenge right now, much more right now with the increase in era. Uh, the lack of clarity in the functional assignments and sometimes overlapping responsibilities across various levels of government among NGAs, across different levels of local government units, uh, as provided in Section 17, kung makita nyo, minsan pa ulit ulit yung uh, roles ng, let's say, for a sector sa province city, na ulit ng province city, municipality, hanggang sa barangay level. So I think there should be a restatement of those functions to clearly define uh, what should be the role across each level so that we have accountability among different levels of local government units. Um, so yeah, to avoid the duplication in these ordered structural responsibilities in the devolution plan, there's a need to review, and clarify the delineation of responsibilities across different levels of government. There should be a clear delineation of the fully devolved, ano ba yung fully devolved talaga, local government units lang, and at which level is this at the provincial, city, municipality, or barangay level, and also define the what is shared function across national and local governments and even those across different levels of local government units. There's also a need to revisit the existing laws and policies that may be no longer uh, be attuned to LGU needs and responsibilities under the full devolution setup, such as um, imposition of the statutory obligation for LGUs to allocate uh, their budget for certain purposes. Though these uh, policies aim to 
ensure allocation for certain national priorities and advocacy. However, these obligations uh, somehow limit uh, LGU expenditures to much needed interventions in certain priority areas or sectors not included in the expenditure items eligible for financing under the said funds. For example, the 20% development fund, our lim the LGU's limitation on the PS, so they have a PS cap, allocation for gender and development. How about, how about for the other sector, uh, allocation for uh, DRM fund, for children, for PWD and the senior citizen and the rest. Um, with greater role and additional resource uh, for local government units at hand, there is a greater demand for supervision of local government units. There's a need for and incentive mechanisms and systems of national government to ensure that as you join the bandwagon of good performance, yun yung aming mga tagline, that government uh, and that government services are delivered. So I think there's a need to expand and redefine our assessment of local government performance based on output and outcome. It should expand to outcome vis-a-vis -vis the capacity. For example, our SGLG is all across provinces, cities, and municipalities. There's no distinction whether first, second, third class, or fifth class. Probably, yeah, you can explore that. Improve the performance monitoring through the triangulation of the different monitoring system already existing uh, at the DILG. Uh, for example, the SGLG is a performance assessment of local government's performance based on the perspective of the national government. And we had then before the, uh, the LGPMS, with, which is local government's uh, assessment of their own performance. And we have now the uh, SIS. Uh, this is the um, uh, assessment of the performance of the local government units. So to better understand uh, the performance of local governments and how best to support them, there should be a clear uh, triangulation of all this assessment based on the three different perspectives. Then probably we can continue, the, oh, well, continuation, in LGSF is already a, a, a some kind of an, of an equalization grant. So I think we should continue that. That is based on certain uh, need requirement and requiring certain level of performance then the local government needs. So I think uh, it should be continued by the national government. So yun, napakadami, no? There are a lot of things that needs to be done. Uh, so ano na yung action are the things that are currently being done by the national government, well, particularly DILG. Um, preparatory work, well, through the leadership of the DBM, there's an executive order being prepared uh, to spell out the transition activities in preparation for um, in preparation for uh, the FY2022 implementation of the Supreme Court ruling, including the relevant uh, capacity building uh, activities, adjustment in the existing performance management incentives, and um, uh, corresponding preparation for the organizational structure of local government units. Uh, there are several studies being proposed, and some of them are being carried out with the support of our development partners. These are on the review of the functional and revenue assignments of local government units, um, revisiting the cost sharing schemes between national and local governments, study on the organizational implication to national government because they're I think, especially for DPWA, substantive, uh, substantial amount of funds will now go to local governments. Therefore, there might probably be some personnel staff that will be affected. Uh, policy studies on the development of competency framework for key LG positions, other than those um, uh, of the budget officer and analyst, wherein there are already uh, clear performance um, qualification requirements and performance uh, assessment being done. Then policy studies on the performance incentive systems and monitoring system mechanism. Um, of course, uh, we are preparing for the capacity building, strengthening of the capacity building of local government units, particularly for those to be devolved services. So there's the development of system to facilitate the programming and prioritization process, the study on, uh, well, activities to support LCU capacity building. Um, on monitoring and incentivizing local governments, um, 
we have lined up the development of a system to capture all projects uh, funded by local by local budgets and this is cur currently being done this is also in support of our uh, or our follow up or our previous programs of the DILG such as the full disclosure policy and uh, and the rest so now actually ongoing ang mga consultations although i think it might not have reached the local government units directly but then among national government agencies and maybe uh, among the uh, the leadership of the leagues of local government units there has been ongoing consultation uh, in relation to the uh, finalization of the executive order and uh, the DILG has ongoing uh, uh, activities on strengthening national, subnational, local planning in its link to budget, as well as current review of the enhancement of the seal of good local governance performance uh, in compliance also pursuant to uh, the passage of the new law uh, on the seal of good local governance act that there's a need to enhance the existing SGLG indicator, the tool for assessing LG performance and rightfully. Uh, siguro pwede nang ma-include yung mga expected of local governments come uh, red revolution by 2022. And of course, um, uh, we are expanding our engagement with the civil society organization uh, so that uh, they can help us enhance transparency and accountability uh, of local government units, monitoring the transparency and accountability of local government units. So, marami pang dapat gawin. I don't know if these are uh, enough, but these are some of the activities that are already in line up, naka line up for the DILG in coordination and in collaboration with the oversight agency, DBM, NEDA, and UF. So, marami pong salamat. Thank you. Thank you. Marami salamat din po, Director Anna uh, Bonag of uh, the DILG, BLG, DILG, BLGD. Um, we appreciate your comprehensive remarks as well as your updates on the preparatory activities being undertaken by uh, the government, particularly the DILG, um, for uh, the implementation of the Supreme Court decision. Okay, now let us hear the comments of the man who pushed for a revisit of the computation of uh, the era of our local government units. The lead petitioner himself, uh, Governor Herminilando, in Comandanas, uh, he was governor of the province of Batangas from 1995 to 2004, and then served as a member of the House of Representatives representing the second district of Batangas from 2004 to 2013. And from 2016, he was elected again as governor of the province of Batangas, and he is currently the chairperson of the Re Regional Development Council or the RDC of Region 4A, Cal Calabarzon, and the chairman of the Regional Development Committee, uh, Luzon. Here now is Governor Mandanas for his comments. Sir? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, well, my the first point is why we have been fighting for this uh, uh, correct share of the local government units in the collection of uh, national taxes. Uh, it's because it's very clear that we need to expedite huh, the uh, delivery, well, the effective and efficient and economical delivery of basic services, but especially right now. Uh, as uh, we, we are hoping, the Supreme Court uh, decided favorably. And because of that, the right share <clears throat> now has been supposed to be already implemented. There's been, uh, you would say, final and executory since uh, April 10 of 2019. Now, what have been being discussed all this time is the, uh, the right definition of the uh, national taxes, which should be the basis. And, uh, well, in terms of implement, so it has been defined, all taxes now are included. Before, as was explained earlier, uh, the national internal revenue taxes alone would serve as a basis. Hmm? Uh, but even there, actually the first part of the decision 
or of the, of the petition was actually even when the basis of the just share was well now it's different already so was uh, the national internal revenue taxes even the amount being used by the national government through the development bank uh, to the development to the uh, uh, dbm uh, budget management development uh, department of budget and management has been it has been wrong huh? uh, even and why because they were not including all the national internal revenue taxes uh, probably you have noticed that even in the study that was presented the focus has been inclusion of all which was really the second part of the decision the first part of the decision uh, hasn't been discussed when it should be already uh, implemented uh, now uh, so in other words the collection of the national internal revenue taxes by the Bureau of Internal Revenue offices alone are the ones that are that have been included in as a base so the Supreme Court ruled that no national internal revenue taxes collected not only by the Bureau of Internal Revenue, but also the national internal revenue taxes collected also by the agents should be included. In other words, don't limit the base to the national internal revenue taxes collected only by BIR but should include also the agents like an example given was the bureau of customs the bureau of customs collect not only tariff and uh, custom duties but the bureau of customs also collect value added tax uh, excise tax documentary stamp, document stamp tax those have not been included by the DBM in the computation of the base. So that alone, for example, in 2020, now this year, there'll be around 200 billion not included. And these are supposed to be automatically released. Uh, the DBM has already given the local governments their share in the collection of uh, national taxes for 2021. But even in that computation, again, which will be the basis of our budget for local government for 2021, again, they did not include the collection of national internal revenue taxes uh, collected by the agents of BIR, which are, again, your customs. The, the decision even already included the uh, national internal revenue taxes collected by the uh, provinces of the autonomous uh, regions of Muslim Mindanao, also those collected by the other uh, local governments. So if you include all of them, the error or the shortfall in 200 billion. In other words, only for, for 2021, that would be, well, another, actually it would be another, it would be 300 to 300 billion. It's actually 300 billion that will be the shortfall. So, and then the other point I'd like to point out in line with what was presented to us before, uh, this error has to be rectified and the has to be rectified retroactively retroactively uh, because this is a simple error of 
in computation. Uh, they didn't include, it says, the exclusion of the other national internal revenue taxes. Now, of course, I recognize as a petitioner that for the other increase due to the inclusion of all taxes, not only uh, the uh, national internal revenue taxes, then we really have also to, uh, that would be prospective already. So that the, the second portion of the increase, which is the inclusion of all national taxes, not only national. So it would, that would increase again by, uh, that would increase starting the release would be on 2022. Huh? Why? Because uh, it's clear in the local government code that the collection for the, or the release for the current year will be based on the uh, certified collection of uh, national taxes at, starting from the date of the Supreme Court decision, finality, that would be uh, fiscal year 2019. So counting three years, it would only be in 22 that the, uh, the full increase uh, will be given, will be released. So, and I also would uh, posit, I would also, I, as I recommended in my letter again to uh, the Executive Secretary, uh, the implementation of the, uh, the old definition of the base, which is national internal revenue, should already be implemented now while the, imp the implementation of the second part would be could be implemented later. And this could easily be done because uh, right now, in the, if you've noticed the Bayanihan, uh, the Bayanihan, they're planning to realign in Congress. Well, they have, they have already finished their bicam so much, 162, 63 billion. So instead of that realignment, all that has to be done is really to uh, release this and uh, do not release, to withhold the release of what has been uh, well included in the uh, General Appropriation Act as amended. So there will be no increase, in other words, in the total uh, net expenditure of the country. None. Because as was explained earlier, it would be just a matter of, uh, let's say, realigning instead of, for, for the devolved services, in, instead of putting them in the, uh, instead of Congress, uh, putting them in, their, in the general appropriation bill, then it just would just be eliminated. In other words, really, when the total revenue or the total uh, uh, funds uh, uh, for budgeting purposes, the internal revenue allotment should not be included because this is a trust account. Huh? It is clear in the law that the definition of uh, automatic, which means no need for appropriation, and the Supreme Court was has been very definite, explicit, that there is no need of passing or no need for this to be uh, deliberated on even by, by Congress, as differentiated from uh, what they call automatic appropriation. Appropriation means it still has to be part of the uh, of the, of the general appropriation bill, but when it comes to the, to the uh, automatic release, then no need for appropriation, no need for passing to Congress. 
it was used to that the Supreme Court used the word it's really superfluous already. Right? So in other words, if if the if it would be as it should, the shortfall for 2020, this particular fiscal year, it could be just released right now without any act of Congress. Unlike, for example, the Bayanihan, which is again, which would require uh, passing through Congress because it's part of the General Appropriation Act. There would be a need for supplemental uh, budget. So that it would really expedite uh, and very important, we will be able to pinpoint responsibility. And the sharing of responsibility, we will be able to, uh, the local governments will be able to share this responsibility. And as was pointed out, everything anyway would be under the supervision of the national government. That's why it was emphasized this whole idea of uh, capability building, which I agree, of course, very much. And of course, uh, the, the, the honest way in accordance with law of, in the implementation. So those really would be just my comments in terms of uh, addition to what was presented. The objectives are very clear uh, that the devolved services should be uh, really undertaken by the local government following the local autonomy principle. So, and it has to be for the first source of increase, which is the cor using the correct, well, no, the correct computation. It is not the definition. Correct computation of national internal revenue as base, which is including all, whoever collects, which means uh, provide their agent of BIR. It's BIR and its agents. So, that should be implemented now, and it is retroactive, retroactive. Now, of course, we cannot expect that they could be given out. I mean, we don't have the, the funds, and we don't have to, we would have to be borrowing. The principle of the implementation of this increase is that there should not be any increase in the total uh, expenditure program by the national government. It is just a matter of realigning from uh, appropriated amount and the automatic release, like any trust account. So, uh, therefore, what do we do with the with the back pay, with the era back pay, which amounts to over one thousand billion? <laughs> Uh, which is uh, over one trillion pesos. Well, we already had an experience before when it comes to this automatic uh, release, when really the government cannot do it uh, during the time of uh, President uh, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo. That was a case which, of course, not really of course, but which I, I won also. I filed the case that, I, that about this thing of withholding uh, era, that was the first case on era which I filed in 2003. And in 2004, the Supreme Court uh, decided favorably, but the amount was only 60 billion. Uh, the era back pay at that was 60 billion, and still the government couldn't uh, pay for it at that time. So there was an agreement that it would be paid by the government, and it did uh, it over a period of seven years. And the administration of President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo uh, really complied with it, right? which we are also, uh, of course, in accordance with law, expecting this particular administration to comply uh, with the ruling of the Supreme Court. So that was paid over a period of seven years. This time, uh, of course, we will have to negotiate. My, my first suggestion is not seven years, it's too, too short, probably over a period of 10 years or probably even longer. Uh, but of course, this would require the approval also of every claimant, every local government unit, which I don't think uh, 
would be difficult. And then another point which I'd like to include in the discussion is how is this going to be coordinated? How could this be implemented in such a way that uh, it would promote rather than uh, hinder or uh, diminish the effectivity of this particular uh, mandate. Uh, and that is to use the regional development councils. Uh, that is also provided for in the constitution under the, the, the article on local autonomy article 10 of our uh, constitution one of the sections there is really that the president which has, which has to form this regional council which during the time of president ramos was formed and how it's going to operate stated there because there is a need for coordination implementation and the body that would really coordinate the the activities the delivery of services by the national government and the local government and this one is the the, the chairman and really and the other officers appointed really by the president himself and the, this uh, right now uh, it's under the aegis of the uh, national economic development authority so the whole system really of good governance huh, is there in our constitution and really being implemented in detail with our existing laws the real need is really the is in the implementation it is really in the implementation and to have read it, to implement it well the supreme court you know, following the constitution already has mentioned it already we have to follow the local autonomy provisions because they all based on the principle of subsidiarity which is uh, the basis of order when it comes to governance so that is the reason why we really have to insist on the implementation so that we really, really expedite especially now that we have the covid 19 pandemic that we have to expedite the effective benefit. It's very timely that uh, PIDC is really having this particular uh, uh, webinar, this virtual meeting, and uh, Miss Anna, and of course Celia and everybody else uh, really is participating. So that would be my reaction and part of the discussion. Uh, I'm leaving with you and probably everybody could be provided with my letters to the executive secretary and exactly what they have mentioned. Likewise, I uh, don't have yet, we could give you the, the, the uh, Supreme Court decision on this issue, uh, which I just always have to stress. There are two parts, two parts, two two different ways that the Supreme Court uh, has seen its wisdom to really uh, give, let's say, uh, give the, the, the facility to really, for, for the local government to discharge its responsibility. Huh? Uh, and, and so the one related to the right amount of national internal revenue code, which is effective from 1992 up to 2021, when it comes to the release. And then the other one is the right interpretation of national taxes, that it should include all not only the correct national internal revenue tax, but also uh, the other national taxes and customs duties and the others also will have to be included as 
already defined in detail by the uh, and the purpose is very important that is really needed now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Governor uh, Mandanas. We also uh, invite you to join uh, the open forum. Uh, but before that, um, um, Director Anna mentioned a while ago about the um, critical importance of having the DPM and, and the uh, DOF in this uh, webinar. Actually, we invited them. We invited their officials, uh, the, the, B, uh, the BI, uh, Bureau of Local Government Finance um, Executive Director, as well as uh, officials of uh, the DPM. Unfortunately, they are not available to attend our webinar. Okay, so we are now uh, ready to entertain your questions, but uh, before we do that, may I ask Dr. Manasan for her response to the comments of our discussions. Ma'am Chat. At this point, I, I think we should just proceed with the questions. I see some okay. questions already. Thank you very okay. much. Okay, Ma'am Chat. Okay, so uh, before we do that, let's have a poll. And uh, if you if you will recall in Dr. Manasson's presentation, she recommended that as a way to finance additional revenue, so the government may consider uh, unfunding uh, PAPs or programs, activities, and projects that are in the budgets of some NGAs, but supposedly should be um, this PAP should be undertaken by the LGUs per Section 17 of the Local Government Code, and, and thus this should be transferred to the LGUs. So this indicates additional functions for our LGUs with the additional revenues that they will receive with the implementation of the Supreme Court ruling. So in effect, with higher revenues come more responsibilities. And in this regard, um, do you think our local government units are ready to absorb more functions? Yes or no? So tell us what you think, and we will reveal the results of this poll before the end of the webinar. Okay, so we are now ready to entertain your questions. And for our Q&A, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Manasan, Director Benagua, and Governor Mandanas to answer uh, uh, the questions. So may I request all of you to please turn on your video so that our audience can see you. Director Bonagua and uh, Governor Mandanas, please. Please uh, turn on your videos. Okay, so let, let us start our open forum uh, by, um, okay, we have a question here from one of our um, WebEx uh, participants. And this one is from John Louis Cesar Luz Luzon. Um, and he asked, um, in light of the recent pandemic, how will this affect the ability of the national government to provide for the just share of the LGU's um, IRA? And if we can also connect this to the um, one of a, a question from Noel Bangsal of the CPDRD, um, because he was mentioning about uh, okay by 2020. She, he mentioned that by 2022, when this decision will be operational, deficit will be about 8 to 9 percent. And given this context, especially in light of the urgent fiscal stimulus needed for economic recovery, can the national government declare a situation where there is unmanageable public sector deficit for Section 284 of the LGC and adjust the ERA share from 40 percent to no less than 30 percent? And how this can this be reconciled with the urgent need for for the national government to have control over fiscal resources to finance the country's economic recovery. Okay, uh, may we hear from our panelists, uh, Dr. Manasan, and also from Director Bonangua and uh, Governor uh, Mandanas, Ma'am Chat. May we start from you? Um, okay. Uh, with regards, I'm really not inclined personally to suggest to government that it declares an unmanageable public sector deficit uh, for various reasons it uh, first it 
it would have a negative impact on the uh, ability of government to access the private capital market, particularly international. So many negative impacts on trading, etc. Um, by 2022, I'm hopeful that the requirements. I'm hopeful my vaccine, <laughs> whether it comes from Russia or China <laughs> or wherever. I mean, I'm making light of it, but I'm I'm really hopeful by that by that time. The COVID response, the need to respond to the emergency situation will not be as severe as it is now. Of course, the issue ng fiscal stimulus, di ba? Yun yung susunod eh, because people will demand fiscal stimulus. And hope, well, first, hopefully by 2022, nag recover na yung economy so revenues will go up so maybe hindi ganon kalaki yung deficit except na maybe national government would still want to be more expansionary so that it generates more growth so to make so my my short answer is there, there is, in fact, I think 2020, 2021, maybe up to 2022, na mas, mas maluwag tayo in terms of the fiscal deficit target. Uh, in fact, in, at early on, I said that's one of the options, di ba? Deficit financing. Yeah, but, deficit financing. I mean, uh, okay. Okay, pa tayo in the short term, but maybe 2023, ayo na natin makita na kadung deficit, especially 2024. That's, I think, my short answer. Thank you very much, Dr. Manasan. Um, Director Bonagua, any thoughts? Uh, I'll just focus on the statement regarding. Uh, uh, adjusting the era share from 40% mm -hmm. to no less than 30%. 30%. Uh, uh, doing that will require le legislation. And um, at this point in time, uh, with local government units just winning their fight on the era, then reducing it to 30% will be a, a somehow a, a big hurdle to... Uh, Yon. So I think it it may not be feasible to happen. Uh, and on uh, uh, regarding the government's um, uh, role on the over fiscal resource to finance the country's economic recovery, maybe the, the solution is to involve the local government units in the country's economic recovery, since uh, forty percent of the resources are within. So hindi lang naman national government ang. Um, my uh, critical role in the country's economic recovery. Thank you very yes. much, Director Anna. Uh, Governor Mandanas? Sir? Governor Mandanas? Hello, Paul. Uh -uh. Is there any thoughts, Paul, sir? And can you, can you um, uh, enable, can you turn on your uh, video, Paul, so uh, the audience can see you? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear you very well. But okay, can you turn on your video, po, sir? Your video, nyo para makita ka namin. Am I okay now? Yes, sir. Okay. They always say that I am better heard than seen. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let me just address the uh, issue of COVID. Uh, first, I mean, there are several questions, I believe. So I'd like to answer mm -hmm. more. Uh, the one that it comes to my mind immediately is whether this is the right time yes. during COVID to implement uh -huh. the uh, decision of the Supreme Court uh, to already uh, release part of the increase right now. So the answer is yes. yes. Not only does it... Uh, 
follow the law, but we can really expedite, expedite the delivery of services which are needed right now, like delivery of food. Mm -hmm. uh, probably this should be in line also whether the who is better doing it, whether it's the local uh, government or the national government. Right now it's being done by the national government. But then we have to consider that social services is really one of the legally determined uh, devolved service. So following the law, it should really be performed by the local government. But right now, in the, in the distribution, for example, of the food packs, of the social amelioration, I'm sure you know that the, the provinces are specifically excluded in the whole process by the national government. While it is actually the province that is supposed to supervise uh, social services of the other LGUs. And uh, it's very obvious that those who are the arms of government that closer to the people could better handle it. They would know who are really deserving or not deserving. And the same thing with the other, the, even distribution of the other things, other devolved services, like in agriculture. In, so in other words, it should be done now, even in the recovery program. We don't have to stop, to stop the build, build, build. It will be continued, but this time on the local level, at the local level, it will continue. And mm -hmm. look, look what's happening. When you, we now try to appropriate uh, funds to, that would be immediately needed, it still has to pass to Congress. Mm -hmm. While when it comes to the national uh, when it comes to the internal revenue allotment, we could do it at this hour. It just requires the approval of, well, it's just for the national treasurer to release because it's automatic release. No need of passing through any, any other action, not required. So we really would make it fast and we'll be able to give more. We're all really going to give more. And it's really going to be more efficient. Why? Because the local government, we know what are really needed in our own areas. The need in Abra would be different from the needs in Bulo. Uh, the needs in Cebu would be different from the needs in Ilocos. Huh? So that is the reason why it has to be released now. It would really look, even in quarantine, uh, the, the national government through the national the DILG, Department of and, and the DOH, has required the cities and municipalities, the local governments, to put up quarantine areas uh, to handle the, to, to do the tracing, the testing, and all that. But where is the money? The money will have to be downloaded yet by the national. Huh? Eh, kung patay na ang kabayo, eh, paano ano ano pa natin ang damo? So, that is okay. the reason. This one. Okay, then, okay. sir, yung this, the second question po, in terms of uh, adjusting the Irish share from 40% uh, to uh, no less than 30% uh, uh, in, in 2022, in case, in case uh, this economic construction persists and we'll have a fiscal you know, a uh, fiscal uh, deficit of about 8 to 9% by then. So is this okay. suggestion Let's, palatable to you? Baka hindi, no? <laughs> Let me answer this. The release of the correct amount of share in the just or the era, now, it has nothing to do whether we're going to declare uh, this economic... Uh, dislocation that would really uh, allow or would really enable the national government to reduce from 40 to from 40 to 30 why because the the, the release of the right amount 
which looks like increase in the era, does not increase the deficit that we have. Why? Mm -hmm. It does not. Because all, all we are, we're trying to do is, who is the in, in the implementation, who will implement it? In other words, the same amount of money is there. Uh, I mean, it, it is a matter of really arithmetic. Oh, yeah. uh, because uh, what we have, all we have to do is instead of the national government using this sum of money, it will now be downloaded, released, as ordered by the Constitution and the laws and the Supreme Court, just released instead to the local government and the local government will be the one to spend. It's the same amount of money. For those in the stock market, it's, just, it's a wash. So no increase in deficit. That is the mm -hmm. whole thing. Uh, I know that I had to explain it in when it came out in 2018, this decision to the Secretary of, uh, of Budget and to the Secretary of... Because there is no increase in deficit if you release. But there will be just a faster implementation. We could bring faster the food on the table of our people. We would okay. be able to recover faster. We would be able to put up really more testing you know, because everything is subject to the national. So national would just be supervising. Mm -hmm. We will be able to act faster. That is the whole idea of local autonomy, the whole idea of subsidiarity. Who can better do this function that have been devolved? The national or the local? That's why they have been devolved. It's, it's local if they want to do it. So no effect on the total deficit because there will be no increase. So that one, the whether it's going to be, whether we are going to have, a, 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 you know, like a bad economic situation uh, that would that would reduce the era. Uh, they're actually they're not related, honestly speaking, uh, from an uh, accounting point of view and from a budgeting point of view and from fund management point of view. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Governor Mandanis, for your thoughts. Okay, let's now go to the next question, and this time this is from uh, Pamela Manalo of the the CTB Party. Okay, and he and she said um, the era formula has its inherent inefficiencies and inequities that feed into horizontal fiscal imbalance. With a larger era by 2022, these inequities or inefficiencies are effectively enlarged as well. How do you think? Could we proceed uh, to correct the uh, inequities or inefficiencies that the era carries with it? May we hear from uh, Mam Chat and then um, also from Director Bonago after Mam Chat? Just answering Alex Brillante's question related to this, I put it in the chat box. And okay, ma'am. Essentially, what I'm saying is in vertical fiscal imbalance issue, even if you take the totality of all services devolved for LGUs, not just this incremental arising from the unfunding of certain PAPs in the ancient mm -hmm. budgets. The first best solution really is amending the distribu era distribution formula mm -hmm. uh, in the local government code. So instead of 23% for provinces, 23% for cities, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, you change that, that is more in line with ano talaga yung cost of devolved function. The totality of all the cost of devolved function. Uh, in relative terms, I think uh, it is very important also for people to understand now, if you do a standard costing, most likely, kulang pa rin yung ira na yan, or even the NTA, the National Tax Allotment. Mm -hmm. Kulang pa din siya because pag standard costing siya, and given all the requirements, uh, 
hindi talaga mako-cover ng existing budget. Ganon din naman ngayon, di ba? Whether you look at the national government, ganon din naman na hindi all the things we wish we have, hindi na atin na afford. So calibrated. Anyway, so sa akin yun yung first best na solution to the vertical balance imbalance problem. Um, but the issue with that is for the longest time that has been proposed already as an amendment to the local government code. And mm -hmm. it has never passed, you know, it has never gone beyond proposal. Because mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. the winners and losers, well, of course, the LGUs would always want to have a bigger pie. Uh, tingin nila doon lahat sila panalo, hindi sila mag-aaway. So, so it's really that part. Um, but having said that, yung horizontal imbalance, hindi siya kayang sagutin ng, mm -hmm. ng codal amendment. I mean, hindi siya kayang sagutin ng just changing the allocation across levels. Mm -hmm. You really need to design an equalization grant over and above the block grant. Okay. Ma'am Shat, thank you for that. Uh, yung, yung expenditure assignment, kasi kanina sabi ni, ni Director Banagawa, uh, this um, SC decision is also one way to fix the expenditure assignments of uh, mga subnational units. Ano? Is there a need to amend the L LGC in order to to, uh, no, to fix that expenditure assignment. Uh, this is a question from Noel Bangsal. Before I go to Director Bonagua. Actually, there were many proposals. The last um, uh, proposal, I think, was done just prior to the 20, um, ano ba yun, 19 election. Uh, kailan nga ba yun, Anna, when we were talking with Senator Sani and Gara. So, there were proposals, but they, they didn't fly. I, mm -hmm. I think the proposals were more in line with clarification. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Na, kasi when I started the presentation, I say, well, if you look at the local government code right now, the sectors are very broadly defined. So, nagkakagulo. You know, like yeah. agricultural extension, anything mm -hmm. about agricultural extension, social services, which has been mentioned a while ago, parang sinasabi, lahat siyan LGUs. When, in fact, I think it is very important to look at yung, and what we call unbundling. Ano ba yung mm -hmm. subcomponents, say, ng social services that are appropriate na devolved? And what mm -hmm. are the parts na mas appropriate na mas, mas national say. And this is, I think, where Anna said something about uh, may some services that are best shared, let's say. Shared. Yes. And, and, and that's where you need clarification. Okay. Thank you, Ma'am Shat. Uh, Ma'am Anna, any thoughts? Yung first, yung sa question on how can we... Uh, fix the inequities and inefficiencies that will be effectively enlarged uh, given uh, bigger bigger revenues uh, with the implementation of uh, the decision by 2022. And then yung sa second, yung sinabi nyo na expenditure, fixing the expenditure assignments, is there any for amendment of the LGC to, uh, okay. to implement that? Okay. okay. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, una, actually, I mentioned it earlier that um, uh, in order to um, espouse equity across local government units, hindi kaya ng isang formula lang. So, yes. uh, even with a block grant as ERA, mm -hmm. so you, you cannot um, um, correct inequities using just one grant. So, there has to be mm -hmm. other transfers designed to fill in the gaps like performance mm -hmm. and or equity grants yeah. mm -hmm. or even... Uh, very specific grants to address certain issue at the local level. Um, changing, uh, well, yung una din, changing the allocation, of course, requires um, uh, local government code amendments. No? There has been a lot of um, proposals since uh, 
the Lukun Kaob nung, I think, uh, year 2008-9, there were there several JI, uh, proposals by JICA on the different uh, formulation. I think there are nine formula in order to correct the inequities, incorporating equity in and poverty level across different local governments. So, but then it did not pass. Um, uh, and also um, changing the expenditure assignments, because these are already given under the local government code. No? Uh, so if there has, it has to be changes in the assign, expenditure assignment to certain level of local government units, even designating which ones to be shared, uh, should be also provided under the local government code. Uh, well, ang iniisip namin noon, if still within that area, uh, baka pwede siyang ma-resolve by the administrative issue once probably through the transition plans of the national government that uh, very specific uh, uh, service, uh, ano yun, very specific services uh, that is still within the local government code, pwede siyang i-correct under an administrative issue once. So baka kaya okay. So that's, that's okay. the thing that I'm saying na this, maybe this is an opportune time to correct some of those na ano ba talaga kasi we're transferring some funds to local government in this by 2022. As, as, mm -mm -mm. Uh, uh, siguro doon pwede mo nang uh, i-correct yung iba no? na hindi mm -hmm. man nagbabari not uh, go away or not very far from what is provided under Section 17. And then ano po yung isa mong question? So I think that... Yeah, so, mukhang yun na, yun na yun 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 yun. Yun. Okay, so, uh, Director Anna, if may I have if I may have a follow-up question. And this one is from Oli Lucas, actually related to dun sa poll natin ano, yun na nga. Uh, yun nga yung yung uh, with with the higher revenue snook, so they would have also uh, bigger or or uh, more functions. So pero ang sabi ni Oli Lucas, what's the readiness of LGUs to receive and spend this additional amounts? There's like you know, it's like a chicken and egg situation here where LGUs might need to beef up and cap capacitate their staff to develop plans and programs. Is there a schedule for hiring and capacitation? Also for capacitating CSOs and people in the grassroots to monitor and make their officials accountable. I think Kanina, dun sa comments you, you mentioned of uh, some preparatory activities that are being undertaken by by the LG by the the, the DILG. Yeah. Yes, she like. Well, I I read that question in the chat. No, sabi niya, it's just like chicken and egg. Ano ba yung dapat? <laughs> well, well, our uh, I mean, uh, assumption is that since they will be receiving some amount and corresponding mm -hmm. to that amount, there will be additional uh, mm -hmm. uh, functions that national agency has been performing before that will be redevolved to them. So, mm -hmm. yun doon nakabase yung, ano, yung readiness. So, there has to be capacity building so that eventually they should perform that. They should carry out those activities being carried out now by the national mm -hmm. government agencies. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, with the increased resources, of course, their uh, resources for hiring people will also increase. That, that will enable them to hire more competent and uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, people to work for the local government units. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Director Anna. And um, last week, I said, diba, we had the the, uh, the IL, uh, PIDS DILG seminar on um, the CBMS assessment, and we have we received some questions there about the uh, implication of the Mandanas ruling in terms of uh, additional in terms of uh, availability of funding for for the CBMS. Because we found in the PIDS study that. Although there there are a significant number of LGUs that are already implementing that the uh, CBMS, most of them are not doing it or not they are not uh, conducting the data data collection uh, regularly. No, and uh, we have some questions uh, from Cornelio Guantero of the USC School of Law and Governance, um, Kenisa as well as from Percy Salazar, and they are asking if um, oh, can LGUs uh, um, Utilize uh, the additional funds uh, for the CBMS. Meron bang ano may may restrictions ba or nasa sa kanila kung if they will use uh, the additional revenues for the CBMS? Uh, yes, of course, uh, Sheila, they can use that. Actually, with the new law, uh, CBMS now is a law that uh, uh, 
well, hindi naman requires that encourage local all local government units to implement the CDMS all at the same time with the leadership mm -hmm. of the Philippine Statistical Authority, you know, so that they, um, so the, the local government units has all the means to use their internal revenue allotment, including the increase for the conduct of the CDMS surveys with the guidance of the Philippine uh, Statistical Authority. Authority. Okay, thank you very much, Director Anna. Our next question is, well, there's a follow from Pamela Manalo of, uh, of the um, CPBRD, and this one is for Dr. Manasan. Ma'am Shat, can you further explain how you set the comparable level of services across LGUs and determine the expenditure requirement for such level of services? So more on, you know, how, how you carried out this exercise. Okay. The study, more, yeah. What I did is first for each service, for instance, uh, farm to market roads, mm. or maybe uh, the is that we pick an easier example. Um, say, um, part of uh, the DPWH uh, funds for various local, various infrastructure, including local projects. We can think of that as going primarily, say, to roads. And so mm -hmm. there are different uh, LGUs, our are, are provinces are assigned provincial roads, cities have city roads, municipalities have municipal roads. Mm -hmm. And so what I did is to look at the road length or where province per seat i mean for the all provinces all cities all municipalities and use some estimate of uh cost unit cost say to maintain or to uh pave a, a kilometer of road and so that's how we distributed say the dpwh fund uh, in like manner, for instance, you uh, water saline too big, I think we distributed it on the basis of how many households have no water per prob of uh, somebody assigned to water. I don't remember now. Kung saan man siya naka assign. Mm -hmm. Now, the difficulty here is data because not all the variables are directly related to need in relation to the specific PAPs actually may granular data. Yung roads meron eh, pero yung iba, wala. So, some creativity is involved, if I may say so. So, yun. Uh, yung, yung, I, can I just add on to what Anna said about the use of the money for CBMS. Take note. Sure, ma'am. Go ahead. Po. Take note na, and, and, and this will answer all other questions. Can we use it for this or that? So yes. Take mm -hmm. note that the increase is really for, it's a black grant. Mm -hmm. Strictly speaking, LGUs can do what they want. Diba? Uh, it will commingle with the old era, I mean, the old allocation. So they can use it to fund to improve funding for devolved hospitals, even mm -hmm. if they can use it for CBMS. But the, the, the reason we're trying to, to say, and, and that's why I propose that prospectively we should look at the entirety of all devolved services, hindi lang mm -hmm. itong bagong na devolved, and, and try to see whether Ano ba yung tamang distribution so that everybody would have comparable level of services? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, the idea is, hindi mo sinasabing they will spend it the way you estimated it, but if they wish to, you want them to have enough money to do that. So, and that is why sumunod yung next question na, suppose very concerned tayo sa health facility. So that's why we said, okay, if that's a very basic national government concern, the national objectives, especially in the light of the pandemic, the bakulang ng healthcare facilities, then national government should 
have incentive mechanisms. So yun na yung cost sharing. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers questions related. Thank you very much, Ma'am Shat. If I may also, if I may read the question of uh, of uh, Dr. Alex Berliantes, which you already responded in our chat box. Sabi niya, uh, what are your proposals to revise the uh, ERA formula? Shouldn't we include poverty in the formula? And Dr. Manasan answered, in response to Alex's question, vertical imbalance issue is best addressed by revising the existing ERA distribution formula. That is 23, uh, kanina nasabi na ito ni Ma'am Chat, 23% for uh, provinces, 23% for um, cities, 34% for municipalities, and 20% for uh, barangays. But this will require LCC amendment, which will take a while. Okay, um, our next question is from Jean Lopez. Um, how are local development plans and investment programs or the LDIPs that are updated and being implemented by LGUs uh, reckoned with in the determination of projects to be implemented by LGUs. Uh, so he added, uh, there's logic in just increasing the share of LGUs from revenues collected by the national government so, they, so that they can have the leeway in implementing their programs or uh, project priorities. Uh, Director Anna, uh, would you like to comment on this? Um, well, uh, the the FDIT and the AIPLs, even CDP of the government units are very important, especially now that they will have increased resources. So this is our way of um, making sure that uh, national priorities are embedded or integrated into the plans and programs of local government units. Also considering uh, uh, the expenditure assignments and in, in cognizant of the 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 realities on the ground or the needs, the, the requirements of their constituents. So uh, somehow the CDP, the IP and the AIP are the, the link from the national to the local government units uh, harmonization of uh, priorities. Thank you very much, Director Anna, for your uh, response. And this next question is from uh, Dina Pasagi. Um, she's from, I think, from the CPBRD. Okay, with more funds accruing to LCUs as a result of the Mandanas ruling, what could serve as motivation for LGUs to update their schedule of market value or the SMB, thus maximizing RPP collections? Uh, Dr. Manasan, Ma'am Shat, uh, would you like to comment on this? Yes. Actually, what we find found out even before this increase is that yung mga yung cities mm -hmm. which we know uh, for the most part many of them have more money than they need to you need nila for devolved provision of devolved services many of them especially the ncr cities napaka delayed nilang mag update mm -hmm. because they really have so much money it's like sobra sobra yung mas porsigidong mag update ng schedule of market values I, the, I see the provinces, of course, with a little push from the LGF, pero mas, mas nagre-respond sila to the encouragements to update. And I think that's really because they need the money, they have limited um, revenue base, so you, kailangan nila. With this increase, palagay ko, lalo na hindi mag update yung maraming cities. Okay. Mm -mm. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ma'am Chat. No? Okay, we have a question here from um, former Director General of the National Computer Center, Aixenarius. How will you consolidate the data coming from the revenue collection points? Ma'am Chat? I'm not sure I understand the question. Okay, uh, perhaps um, um, Mr. Senares, uh, if you are still... Um, in Webex, uh, we would appreciate your clarification on this question, sir. Okay, this one, Ma'am Chat, is directly addressed to you. This one is from the De Deon Gracias Pernites. Bye uh, bye, cities among the bottom 10 among cities in terms of the per capita difference between our era increase and amount needed to provide comparable um, re redevolved services with. Will this imply bigger national government share considering that we belong to the bottom 10 
among cities? Um, yung ira, hindi na yung, uh, yung ira or national tax allotment share nyo will not change. I mean, given na yun by law, it's defined mm -hmm. by the local government code. So kulang nga kayo, so, di ba? Parang yes. look kayo in a sense because you have to deliver more devolved services uh, relative to the transfers. But yung, I, I think if, and this is very important, if uh, talagang mag-provide ng equalization grant, Mm -hmm. then it is likely that you will get a bigger a share in the equal, equalization grant. Uh, of course, with the caveat na assuming tama talaga yung data ang ginamit namin dito because for the most part, maraming creative use of data because kulang nga yung data. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Ma'am Chat. Let us entertain some questions from our um, Facebook uh, viewers. Um, okay, could you please hold? This one is from... Okay. From Jose Mari Trinidad. Um, he said the list menu of PPA is chargeable to the 20% of the era share of each LG for the... the for development projects are very limited and not tailor made to the needs of most LGUs. Should this be amended or updated? Uh, Director Bonagua, would you like to answer this? Um, yes, uh, we agree. Actually, right now there has been there are already ongoing studies on the review uh, mm -hmm. of the twenty percent development fund, and uh, especially mentioned earlier that this should be reviewed also to attune to the incoming uh, increase in resources to local government units. So uh, definitely uh, this will be adjusted e e even if, if if the law will not, actually the law is uh, very broad in, the, in their statement on the use of the 20% development fund and um, most of the specifics are in the joint memorandum circular of the ILG and DPM and the DPM already initiated the review and in view of the Many requests from our local government units. Uh, the review mm -hmm. has been done prior, even prior to uh, COVID. However, na ano lang mm -hmm. na, na stay lang tayo because of the COVID nineteen extension. So, but then we will continue our review specifically uh, with the impending increase in the uh, revenues of local government units. Thank you very much, uh, Director Bonagua. This next question, uh, I think. She is asking for clarification uh, in, in, in your study, Ma'am Chat, from Sandra Lourdes Paredes. How can there be an excess of 23 billion by 2022 when there is already an NTA adjustment estimated at 98 to 101 billion due to LGUs? The court ruled that beginning 2019, based on all the national taxes collected in the third year preceding the current fiscal year, the term is collected, not still to be collected. Any thoughts on this, Ma'am Chat? Hi, Sandy. I, I think <laughs> uh, the, the 22 billion estimate is in the context of uh, finding fiscal space for the increase in the national tax allotment in 2022 relative to what it would have been if the SC decision did not come about. So that's the excess. Um, I agree with you So other parts no statement. Kasi parang uh, what we're saying is, here is uh, mas marami, and I think uh, Anna said it very nicely when she made her presentation, na uh, pag tinignan mo naman pala itong GAA 2020, mas marami talagang funding na dapat napunta sa LGU, or at least intended for devolved services than mm -hmm the new increase in the IRA by 2022. So I think that's all I'm saying. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mung Chat. Okay, let us um, entertain uh, some more questions. Well, this is a comment from James uh, Miraflor, and it's related to taxation. Sabi niya, um, about the issue of uh, situs of taxation, there is also a problem with revenue imbalance itself, LGC Section 1. 
33 limited the scope of LG's power to create sources of revenue. Uh, section 129 excludes income, estate, inheritance, customs, that from LG powers, but close to half of all tax revenues are income taxes, while sales and customs amount to two fifths. So this means very limited scope for LG use. Uh, any any uh, comment on this, Mam Chat? Uh, very limited scope. I agree, very limited scope, especially for um, provinces. Mm -hmm. But if, but, and, but I think there are actually proposals in another paper on how to expand the uh, revenue base of LGUs. Uh, for instance, motor vehicle registration uh, charges, the old MVUC, etc. Those are maybe more appropriately assigned to LGUs. Uh, CITUS is mm -hmm. a complex matter in the sense na nagko-collide yung estimation niya with um, the financial reporting requirements ng on, on uh, corporates in particular. So, mahabang discussion yun, maybe uh, we can just stop offline. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, a follow-up question from Pamela Manalo kasi kanina pinag-uusapan natin yung uh, redevolution, red, mga, mga devolved functions, um, and this one is about, let's say, healthcare services such as immunization. Sabi niya kasi there are services such as immunization that are really best administered by LGUs, but in terms of budgeting and fund management, it may be more efficient to keep it at the national level. Um, um, for example, because this, this, they can benefit from bulk purchases by the national government. In such case, by which consideration should we decide to devolve such service? Uh, Ma'am Anna, Director Anna, would you like to comment on this? Uh, well, um, yan yung sinasabi natin na we should uh, delineate which ones are best performed yes. level. Uh, but yes. then we also have to consider the the principles of economic economies of scale, yes, and externalities and the redistributed re, redistributive principle or or, mm -hmm. or function of the government. So I think we need to balance. You no, know, while uh, the the local governments are the one administering the delivery of the service, you know, mm -hmm. but it, in terms of procurement of uh, the supplies can be done by the national government, which is what's happening right now. So I think we, we should assess uh, if this is the the most effective yes. and efficient way of doing this. If mm -hmm. we find so, if we continue, if there are some better recommendations, I think we should carry it out. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much, Director Anand. Yes. I that? Go I ahead, like this, I, I like this example very much because it's the best example to clarify Mm -hmm. I think what we mean by shared um, yes. expenditure uh, or assignment. If if mm -hmm. you look at health, you you curative care, mm -hmm. uh, you hospitals, you may be beneficiary on for the most part. Kung sino man yung nagpunta sa hospital, ba? So, talagang fully in, in that sense, if you look at the principles of fiscal decentralization, talagang fully devolved tapat yon. Financing, dapat provincia, uh, delivery sila subject to standards set by the national government. But if you look at immunization or other components of what is called health promotion in the mm -hmm. Universal Health Care Act, um, many of those services are from the perspective of economics, what we call public goods, meaning hindi lang yung tinurukan ng vaccination ang nagbebenefisyohan but also yung kanyang kapitbahay and even yung kapit probinsya niya because with vaccination you get herd immunity di ba? if you make that solely you for instance in procurement ng vaccine purely a local government functions function the LGUs will underspend Mm -hmm. relative mm -hmm. to attaining her herd immunity. So that is why uh, part of the financing, yung financing ng uh, commodities for vaccination, for instance, 
is rightly should rightly belong to the DOH. Mm -hmm. But our pan is right na yung delivery talagang local yun eh. Mm -hmm. Diba? Kasi hindi na, otherwise, DOH will will go back to the old system na meron silang doktor at nurses sa bawat barangay, sa bawat municipio. So, so this is really the sharing and this is the unbundling we were talking about. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Manasan. Uh, this next question is from Rodian uh, Ferranco, one of our WebEx uh, participants, and he's concerned about um, how to make our our officials more responsible and more accountable given uh, the additional revenues that our LGUs will will receive. I think um, Mam Ma Anna mentioned a while ago about um, revisiting the um, seal of local governance. Uh, the, the SGLG and um, uh, having, you know, uh, more stringent uh, mechanisms in, in terms of uh, assessing the, the performance of our LGUs. Uh, Director Ada, would you like to expound uh, your, your comments related to um, how we can, um, how, can, how we can make our, our um, uh, local governments more accountable and more 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 responsible. Uh, microphone. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, even right now, there are already systems in place um, to ensure uh, transparency and accountability uh, in the performance of uh, the functions of local government units, especially in the uh, disbursements of funds. So there are uh, systems in place by uh, the Bureau of Local Government Finance, such as the reporting of government expenses, uh, expenditure through the uh, statement of receipts and expenditure. Uh, and uh, for BILG, where we are monitoring the performance of local government units. So uh, I think we just have to expand all this and strengthen all this monitoring system in order to capture how local government uh, uh, deliver their services and to ensure that we are able to capture uh, 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 these things in the monitoring in monitoring systems already in place. Um, uh, the presence of the civil society and non-government uh, organizations is also very important since they are being looked up as the, as the watchdog, watch the panggang, pero as gabay of local government mm -hmm. team needs in the performance of sila yung uh, min minsan nangangalabit or you are you are supposed to do this, uh, representing the, the public and the national government. So uh, these are the things that we are currently been doing and should be expanding and strengthening as uh, their resources, the, the resources of local government units in things uh, come 2020. Thank you very much, Director Ana. Perhaps we can also hear the thoughts of um, uh, Governor Mandana, sir. Uh, your, your, your thoughts about uh, you know, how we can make our local governments more accountable and more, more responsible, sir, based on your experience too, and um, programs or probably uh, initiatives uh, that in, in your uh, in your jurisdiction, sir? Well, uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir, very well, Paul. Go ahead, Paul. Okay. Well, it all goes back to our sense of justice as we were talking earlier the question raised from the point of view of uh, equity you know for one would have responsibility or would have a right to the extent that he has a duty so how do we do it well i, I guess it's in the normal course that really the individual himself or the the people in local government, we just have to really study, they have to work, they have to comply with the basic uh, demands of their job, have a sense of responsibility. I mean, it's the practice of all the virtues required. Now, mm -hmm. uh, and this is, again, with the assistance, for example, of, well, even the private sector, the civil society, they, they're all responsive and the real test should be a real honest election 
so that would be, I guess, would be like the, the gauge and would be the motivation for us to have real good uh, local government officials. I mean, th there is no one answer to that. It's always yes, right. a compendium of lot of requirements. Uh, mm -hmm. And also the extent would be the extent of the power or, or that he has, the responsibility that he has. A, a typical example is uh, what we're having right now, our COVID year. Mm -hmm. uh, all the powers, the resources and all are being handled by the national government. So here, the ones who should be well-trained and should be able to do it would be the national government because they're the one responsible. Uh, that's why it's really unfair, for example, for the local to expect the local government officials to be able to handle it well, because by nature, there are certain functions which are better done by, of course, higher authority, national government, but there are some which should be better done by the local government. So when it's come, how could we, well, you know, better prepared for this responsibility? Well, we first delineate, we set the standards, and then apply the necessary controls. Mm -hmm. I guess that's how to do it. The answer is a little general because the general, question yes. is very general. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Governor Mandanas. Okay, um, now let us uh, have um, some questions from our Facebook viewers. This one is from Mam Chat. Uh, okay, I, I thought uh, I, I heard her voice. Okay, this one is from Christina Ortiz, and um, she's asking if uh, the DILG tracks how the era funding is being utilized by the LGUs. Uh, because according to her, uh, According to former DBM Secretary Ben Diotto, more than half of the LGU spending goes to general public services instead of education, health, employment, and social services. With this, how can the government ensure that this increase in era funding will translate to increase or improve public services? Ma'am Anna, is there a monitoring of the era utilization being done by the uh, the ILG? That is the question of uh, Christine Ortiz. Uh, okay. Thank you. I uh, think can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for the question. Actually, um, DILG. Well, DILG per se uh, doesn't have a monitoring uh, system for the internal revenue allotment. So, uh, national other national government agency that's DLGF, DOF, who has uh, uh, a monitoring system on the. Uh, LGU expenditure that's as mentioned earlier is that's to the uh, the reporting system on the statement of receipts and expenditure where they mm -hmm. uh, actually monitor the incomes uh, of local government units, all revenues coming in, and all their expenditure uh, expenses and expenditures. However, um, uh, there are actually limitations in, in those uh, reporting system because we cannot really track. How do I explain? I, I think this should be better explained by the, the LG person. But I think that the limitation is that uh, we can only track per expense code or per, but we cannot really track as to what uh, specific activities these are used or, or we, we, they can even track uh, which uh, uh, department in the local government unit actually uh, did the, ex the disbursements, but as to what activity these were actually use uh, walang gan, um, monitoring. So uh, we are in the process of actually improving the monitoring scheme uh, so that we can actually track all the expenses at the local government. Uh, somehow right now there are some uh, specific um, monitoring for the, let's say for example, for the statutory obligation. So monitoring of the 5% uh, allocation for gender, allocation for disaster preparedness or their end fund this allocation under the 20 percent development fund uh, but this somehow duplicates no within the local government mm -hmm. because your 20 percent development fund can also be 
uh, uh, towards uh, uh, gender and development. So uh, there has to be a clear mechanism that to really see uh, where the full government units are actually using their funds. Uh, we, we might be halfway towards there. <laughs> yes, yeah, there's sure. already a system existing, but uh, I think we have to navigate the the uh, the accounting and uh, accounting. Uh, financial reporting at the local government units level. Thank you very much, uh, Director Anna. We have an interesting question from another Facebook viewer, um, Arnel Guantero. If if I may address this to uh, um, Governor Mandanas, since he is the uh, uh, currently the cha the chairperson of the Regional Development Council uh, of Region for a uh, or Calabarzon and the chairman of the Regional Development Committee for Luzon. Um, Sabinia, what exactly will will be the proposed roles of the RDCs with respect to the implementation of the Bandanas ruling? Although these councils are created in furtherance of decentralization and local autonomy, will the RDCs not serve as another bureaucratic layer? Uh, sir, Governor Mandanas, any thoughts? Yes, the role of the Regional Development Council, as uh, I was mentioned, has been defined in our constitution and in different laws already right now, not only the local government law, several executive orders. And the need is really there for mm -hmm. an entity that is in between the national government and the local government. Because in the implementation of local autonomy, this uh, principle of subsidiarity based on the principle of subsidiarity, there are issues and details that really have to be coordinated mm -hmm. so that we could really promote this uh, uh, efficient uh, social, social and economic development that as is being done right now or should be done right now, the projects of the national, whenever there will be a need for implementation in the local, that they're really discussed in the, in the council uh, because, and they take measures of course, to, in the implementation because it is composed the council is composed of all the governors all city mayors mm -hmm. the, the municipal there is even representative of course of the barangays the civic society the, the academe and also there in every region so there is it's rather than a filter or a so it, it, it really hastens even, it could hasten the development of, mm -hmm, of, mm -hmm. of, of an implementation of the project. Uh, so I believe that it is not uh, like another roadblock, but mm -hmm. it is like a necessary step in the ladder towards development of, for, you know, to, to really promote our development. That, that's how I see it, and that's how our constitution sees it, and that's how mm -hmm. our uh, laws and even our legislative and uh, and judicial really see it. That it really mm -hmm. has to be. It has to be there. It has to be mm -hmm. there. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Governor Bandanas. Another question for you, and this one is from Dr. Alex Berliantes. Do you foresee the RDCs to eventually evolve into regional governments, as in ARMM, or even as states in an envisioned federal system? Well, Dr. Alex and I have been discussing this for a long time, so for the benefit of everybody listening. Really, I believe that we, we are now really, we have a federal system of government at the moment, except that it is weak but with the mm -hmm. implementation of the supreme court decision i believe that it is now we are really going to start with uh, federalism of course, we all know that there's several kinds of federalism i'm not talking about parliamentary or unicameral uh, what, what we're talking here about is the essence of federalism, which is uh, every unit really would have autonomy. There is a central mm -hmm. and there is a, like local 
units, which, which really share governance. And those that could be done better by the national, like foreign affairs, uh, monetary system, like our, uh, of course, our cultural, there are, certain, there, there are certain things that really have to be done by them. The military, for example, the armed forces. But then mm -hmm. there, are, there are services which have to be done really in, in the local level, which have already mm -hmm. been defined by law. So we are really in federalism right now. Mm -hmm. And I think now, if we really implement, and this is really a hope, that uh, activities like what you're having right now, although it sounds like uh, very academic, and uh, uh, but and the participants are more, academic, but it's a very good start that I'm sure that you will be able to contribute in really implementing it, because I think uh, we are this federalism is really good for us. Uh, good for us because we, it is adapted to the to the culture, to the resources, to the traditions, uh, to the uh, way of life. We accept that there is a difference between one place and another, and there is a, a there is a role that an upper authority has to perform, which should be better. But there are also some which the lower authority can better perform. Uh, and that, that is the reason why we have this uh, coordinating body, uh, mm -hmm. which is the RDC at the moment. OK. OK. Thank you very much, Governor Mandanas. It's now uh, 4.33. Uh, actually, we're supposed to end at uh, 4.30. And let's entertain uh, just one more question. And this is, uh, Mamshat, if I can, if I may address this to you, because this is uh, uh, part of your studies. Uh, this one is from Monter de Miki. Sabi niya, it was suggested in the study, identify PAPs in NGA budgets that may be found in the list of functions that are assigned to LGUs, but isn't in the standard already. Please enlighten us. How exactly can this option aid fiscal sustainability and how can LGUs operationalize this option? Um, that part is not meant to be operationalized by NGOs. Mm -hmm. That is meant for the fiscal oversight agencies of the national government. So essentially, what we're trying to do there is to analyze the budget of all mm -hmm. national government agencies, including yung Vitalia niya, and to say, oh, ito, ito palang various local infrastructure na to, so DPWH project for for uh, local governments to kasi ang beneficiary lo local so mm -mm. yun yung ia and fund mo hindi mo na popondo future so that hindi maglalaki yung fiscal deficit ng bubiyan so finding okay. fiscal space within the budget so it's for ang nagahanap don uh, yung fiscal oversight agencies, basically DBM, uh, okay. in consultation with the national agencies. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ma'am Chat. And before we close our open forum, if I, if I may ask our panelists, uh, Dr. Manasan, uh, Director Bonagua, uh, Governor Mandanas, for their uh, final uh, remarks, if they have any, Ma'am Chat. I only want to say na ang dami pang gagawin dito in preparation. Anna has highlighted that and I can only agree with her na all levels would have to cooperate, collaborate with each other. DBM, the fiscal oversight agencies, the national government agencies, even Congress. Kasi ipag-iisipin mo, uh, there was a question dito sa chat box na uh, paano yung mga various local infrastructure dun sa DPWH for the most part Fort Barrel yun. Mm -hmm. Papayag ba yung kongreso na hindi na pondohan yun? Mm -hmm. So yun yung mga ganun. So this would require a lot of work capacitating LGUs uh, working with CSOs. So 
the task is set for everybody. Yes. Thank you, Ma'am Shat. Uh, Ma'am Anna? Um, well, um, message lang natin. Uh, we, we are already, the national government has been preparing for, for this. No? Baka kasi, even if wala kami no consultation yet with local government units, we want to at least polish uh, the things that we will be presenting to local government units as part of the implementation of the, the ruling as decided to be in 2022. So, um, and then, uh, mayon as a level pa lang national government, but rest assured that we'll be collaborating, consulting the local government units uh, uh, for the implementation. Uh, once the draft EO is already clear at the national level, we will definitely consult the local government units. And rest assured that by LC, we will be uh, uh, putting forward the interest of local government units for this. Uh, for the implementation of the Supreme Court ruling. And thank you very much for the cooperation of our local governments and, uh, of course, the collaboration of uh, the leads of local government units, ULAC, LPP, and CP, and, and even the government. Thank you very much, Director Anna. And Governor Mandanas? Yes, well, as, as, as we have been, as we have started, and really the objective of this particular a session is how really we could have a sustainable, inclusive, and really effective way for development. And it is really, well, just really, and my hope is that we really be able to do something in following the rule of law. I think that's the only way. Uh, and this particular law on uh, local autonomy hastening, expediting, explicit development through uh, what is stated in the Constitution and how local and national government should perform. We have to really, one way or another, whatever way we can do, whether it's just in the academe or in the actual practice, like where we are right now in our sector and in your sector, we could work together really to implement the law. We have, you know, they have been properly interpreted, and I still don't see uh, the implementation of laws, uh, and and specifically this particular uh, law, which is essential, really, for development, for the performance of the duties really assigned to us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Governor Mandanas. Well, friends, please join me in thanking our panelists, Dr. Rosario Manasan, Director Anna Bonagua of uh, the ILG Bureau of Local Government Development, and Governor Herminilando Mandanas of the province of Batangas for the knowledge and insights that they have shared with all of us in today's webinar. Let's give them a big virtual clap. Okay, and thank you. Thanks to all of you for your uh, questions and comments, which made our discussion both interactive and enlightening. We really hope our discussion today has been use useful to everyone. Now, let us go to the results of our poll on the question. Do you think our local government units are ready to absorb more functions? Okay, let us see the results of our poll. Uh, uh, we had uh, 181 uh, respondents among our uh, WebEx participants and 115 of those 181 respondents said answered no that meaning that our local governments are not yet ready to absorb more functions okay and uh, on that note i now call on the president of the pids dr celia Rez, for her closing remarks mamsel yes um Thank you, uh, Sheila, and um, I'm sure you'll, you'll agree, everyone will agree with me. We've had a very enlightening discussion. Thanks to our resource person, discussants, and participants. Thank you to Dr. Chat Manasan, Director Anna Bonagua, and Governor Mandanas for sharing their expertise this afternoon. Um, in line with this, uh, I would like to um, invite you to our upcoming webinars. Um, Okay. Yes. Okay. We're sharing um, uh, some uh, 
just a, a few slides because every September, uh, the country celebrates Development Policy Research Month to promote the conduct of policy research and its use towards evidence-based decision-making. And PIDS spearheads the organization and conduct of the different activities participated by different national government agencies and local governments. So in line with this, PIDS has been holding several events in September, including the annual public policy conference. And we choose a theme each year that has important policy implications for us. So in 2018, we focused on the fourth industrial revolution or fire. We discussed how the benefits from technological advancements can be harnessed. Last year, we zeroed in on the new globalization, how increasing protection and trading arrangements under provision of global public goods, including for health, uh, lack of trust and social cohesion would impact the country's economy. This year, we are focusing on governance. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the importance of governance in dealing with risk and building resilience systems. So for this year, uh, the theme would be bouncing back together, innovating governance for the new normal. Next, please. Um, next slide. And we have lined up several events. Um, we have the press conference as a kick of activity on September 1. And then we have this partnership with the Mindanao Development Authority, MINDA. And we're going to have a policy forum on bouncing back stronger through countryside development and agricultural resilience which we're going to have either on September 9 or September 10. And then the highlight of the activities this month, next month um, is the annual public policy conference webinar series, which we're going to have on September 15, 17, 22, and 24. So we will have four webinar series. And the theme, as I mentioned, will be building resilience against COVID-19 and other risk and waiting governance. So for September 15, We'll be focusing on public sector governance for um, resilience under a new normal theory and practice. On September 17, the focus will be on institutional innovations and reforms under the new normal. On September 22, strengthening the civil service under the new normal. And on September 24, smart systems for agile governance under the new normal. So you can find the details. Uh, in the PIDS website. And again, uh, we hope that you will all join us in all of these events. Um, Sheila? Thank you very much, uh, Mamsel. Uh, before we close, we have some reminders for sure. We'd like to have a copy of uh, the presentations that were delivered today, so you can access them from the PIDS uh, website. Uh, um, okay, and uh, we will email all, we will email you the link after the webinar. So don't worry if you will not able to, to catch the link. Uh, a flash on the screen. We will also please also answer the feedback survey that will pop on your screen after this webinar, and we will also email you the link of that survey form. Okay, and uh, we encourage you to please. Uh, Answer the, the feedback survey because your comments are important to us to visit to, to improve our our webinars. Okay. And lastly, please uh, visit our website and social media pages. Thanks to all who um, um, participated, who uh, watched our webinar today, our Facebook viewers, and we also have a Twitter account where we do live tweeting of all our events and of course our uh, website pids.gov.ph where we where we have all um the um, the copies the, the files of our knowledge products as well as updates on our forthcoming events and finally we would like to acknowledge the various organizations from government uh, civil society uh, private sector and international development community as well as from the academe who join us today and you can see the names of these offices on the screen. Okay, and uh, mentioned by by Dr. Reyes, we invite you to our uh, activities in September. We don't have a webinar next week, but see you all in September one for our press conference to kick off the Development Policy Research Month or the DPRM. We have the entirement of September teamed with many with various knowledge sharing webinars. 
just visit our social media pages and the DPRM page at dprm.pids.gov.ph for details as well as our um, website, uh, pids.gov.ph. So this ends our webinar for this week. Thanks again to all our panelists, to um, uh, Dr. Rosario Manasan, Director Ana Bonagua, and uh, Governor Mandanas for their participation this afternoon, as well as to all of you for uh, uh, staying with us. So stay safe, stay healthy, and stay informed, everyone. Marami pong salamat, and see you on September. September 1, okay, that's the virtual uh, press conference and all our activities this, this September in relation to the Development Policy Research Month. Maraming salamat po.